Welcome back to the Dr. Cliff Show. In today's episode, we're gonna teach you a guaranteed way to hear better in background noise. Coming up. All right, we are back live. I'm Cliff Olson, doctor of audiology and founder of Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona, and I am here today with my co-host. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Rachel Cook. I'm also an audiologist at Applied Hearing Solutions, and today's topic is a pretty fun one for me, at least. I love talking about these. We are going to talk about improving your ability to hear and understand in background noise through the use of assistive listening devices. Uh, these are not only great for listening in background noise, but also situations where there's a significant amount of distance between speakers, um, and if you'd like to get your hearing aids hooked up to any sort of media devices. So we're gonna talk today a little bit about how to know if hearing aids alone would help solve your issues, or if you need the additional support that can be obtained through the use of an assistive listening device. And we'll be reviewing all different types of assistive listening devices today as well, because there's quite a few of them. So if you haven't already, make sure you like and subscribe so you can never miss out on any one of our new podcast episodes. And with that, we're jumping into our very first sponsor slot here. All right, so, um, you know, hearing aids can help you in a background noise situation. It really depends on what your type of hearing loss is. But uh, you've probably heard that over-the-counter hearing aids are now available, and one of those brands that are out there right now are, is Soundwave with their Soundtro devices. Now, not all over-the-counter hearing aids are created equal, but the Soundwave Soundtro devices are ones that you should definitely check out. I have reviewed these on my channel. You should go over and check out my review of these particular products. But these devices were developed by Soundwave Hearing out of Oak Brook, Illinois. The Soundwave is a receiver in canal design hearing aid. The Auto-Tune app that you use to program the Soundtro over-the-counter hearing aids makes it possible to customize your own audio settings as well. You can see that app up there on the screen right now and the Soundwave Soundtro devices. Now, if you want to see how these particular devices did in my testing, again, make sure that you go and check out my review video of these particular devices. And if you want even more information, you can head over to hearsoundwave.com. All right, so now we need to get into what is the problem that people have typically when they have hearing aids? Background noise. It's always background it's noise, always right? It's always background noise, yes. And sometimes that's due to actual background noise being present in the environment. And other times it's also just due to distance as well. And as we know and we've talked about on the show, um, distance really has the ability to reduce the amount of energy in a sound and can make it a lot softer by the time it actually reaches you and reaches your ears and both of those issues together can really make for some interesting situations. Absolutely. If you get noise and distance combined into one thing, it's a really big problem. But for today's purpose, we're going to be talking about both of these. But really, when we think about hearing better, using hearing aids, or even not even using hearing aids, we have to understand this concept of signal to noise ratio. Mm -hmm. And when I say signal to noise ratio, I know it sounds like I'm going to be very scientific here, but it's very simple. It's the amount of signal that you want to hear, so speech of someone talking to you, versus the amount of background noise that happens to be in the environment at the same time. Ideally, you would want a very high signal to noise ratio, mm -hmm. and that would mean that things are going to be a lot easier for you to be able to hear. Um, if you get a different varying degrees of signal to noise ratio, though, where you start getting more noise than you do signal, well, then we start having a problem. And if you have a hearing loss, it's an even bigger problem at that point. And so when we start looking at it from the perspective of what can we do in the clinic to help someone understand better in a background noise situation, we have one goal, and that is to make the signal to noise ratio as good as we possibly can. And there's a variety of different ways that we can do that. Some of that we can do with hearing aids and some of that we have to do with assistive listening devices right. that we'll be getting into here in a little bit. Um, but I do wanna pull up a graphic here because there is a certain test that we would perform on someone coming into the clinic called a quick sin test. So a quick speech and noise test. And essentially what's happening here is that we're playing sentences to you and we're having you repeat those sentences back to us even though there's escalating background noise in the background. And so as we progress down through these lists, if you see green, that means that you heard the word correctly and repeated it back correctly. If you see gray, it means that you missed the word because there was too much noise for you to hear and understand it. 
And so when we end up scoring this, we end up scoring it on a scale between 0 and 26. Lower the score, the better. So if you score a 0, it means that you hear better than normal hearing individuals in a background noise situation. And if you score a 26, it means you turn on a ceiling fan, and that's so much noise that you can't understand a thing. And so that test that we had just shown right there, there was a bunch of green on the screen, and they had a very low score. They had a score of 1 which means that the individual needed speech to only be one decibel louder than the background noise before they could understand it, which is very easy to accomplish in a lot of background noise situations. But what happens when that score starts to rise? When that score starts to rise, things get a little tricky. So there's plenty of environments where uh, the signal to noise ratio just in general is not great, right? So think you go to a busy restaurant setting, there's a bunch of people around and you're trying to have this conversation with the person that you're there with and it just seems like no matter how much they try to project or try to raise their voice you still are unable to hear them above the background noise situation and that's when we end up in in this situation where you have so much difficulty actually understanding the signal that you're looking for and when we're doing this quick sin test that's really what we're trying to see is what is the threshold, where where can you continue to repeat back words and sentences correctly, and at what point does that flip-flop? And for some individuals, they're gonna have a really, really great ability to separate out speech from background noise, uh, like a scary great ability. Um, but for other individuals, you put in the smallest amount of background noise and it really interferes with the processing and the understanding and the comprehension of the speech. And so we do have a graphic for this one as well. And on this test, whoa, okay, looks completely different than the other one, right? So if green is good and gray is bad, I'm seeing a lot more gray than I'm seeing green on this screen. And if we look in the upper right hand corner of this test, you'll see very small, but it's there. SNR loss clocks in at 18. So what does an, a score of 18 mean? Yeah, it, a score of 18 means that you need 18 decibels of separation of the signal from the background noise. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you this, that there is no human being on the planet um, that is going to be able to speak at a level that is 18 decibels louder than some moderate background noise that you might find in like a restaurant situation. So the individual that we just tested there would have a horribly bad time functioning in a background noise environment. And the thing that you know I like about this test is that it lets us know mm -hmm. how someone is gonna perform in background noise. I think everyone uh, just thinks that it's some kind of like a guess of how well I should expect to do in background noise when I treat my hearing loss with hearing aids. And it's not a guess. It is a, we know how you should perform. We yeah. know how much separation we need there. And if you end up getting scores that are really bad, so. I start thinking of 10 and higher as being a really bad score on a signal to noise ratio loss perspective. And so once we start thinking about, well, what is a 10 decibel separation that you need? Well, anytime that you increase the volume of something perceptually, it is a doubling in volume. So if you score a 10 on this scale, it means that you need the person that you're talking to to talk twice as loud as the background noise. And they might be able to do that for one sentence and then they're going to go right back yep. to the level that they were talking in and you don't get enough separation anymore. Yeah, and then if we take the value of 18, that is, it's a, it's a logarithmic increase at that point. So 10 decibels, we're doing a doubling of the volume. Nearly 20 decibels is a doubling of the doubling there. So it's, it's not just a, as straightforward as as just adding a little bit of, of extra oomph to your voice there. It is literally doubling the projection level. And if the background noise in a, in a given situation is already louder than you naturally speak at, and even louder than you would even speak at at a higher level, then you stand no chance of doubling your voice in that situation. Absolutely, and I think that I wanna, I wanna drive home this point because you can do this speech and noise testing in a variety of different ways inside of the clinic. We like to test people at their initial hearing test and we are basically compensating for the level of loss that they have with amplification during the test. So it gives us an idea of what they should expect to perform at if we treated them with hearing aids. Now you can do this in an unaided 
fashion as well to kind of show like where you're at right now and mm-hmm. how bad you're doing in noise now and how good you could potentially get if you treat your ears with hearing aids. Yeah. Um, but we like to do this because we want to see, okay, best case scenario, if I do my job perfectly and I program a set of hearing aids to an individual's hearing loss prescription and verify it with realer measurements, what is the response that we're going to get? Yep. Sometimes you get a really good score. And if you get a really good score, then there is no need to go and start using a lot of these assistive listening devices that we're going to start talking mm-hmm. about here. But if you score really poorly, the only way to get that number to drop down significantly is not to get the best hearing aid in the world, which helps, but that's not the answer. The answer is using assistive listening devices. Most definitely. And I think this brings up a good point too, that you don't even have to be an excellent candidate for one of these devices to receive a a huge amount of benefit from them. I think that they're actually pretty under recommended. Um, You know, hearing aids can be expensive. And a lot of times I do feel like providers uh, hesitate to say, oh, would you like this device? Would you like this device? You know, they, they don't want to seem like they're pushing too many products, but so many of these assistive listening devices can make major, be, be a major, major game changer for so many individuals. So I definitely think that they're worth considering. And so then how does an assistive listening device actually function? If you start thinking about, I'm having trouble in background noise, like how is this actually going to help? What is this going to do? Exactly. So what an assistive listening device is really trying to do is first and foremost, trying to shorten the distance between the sound signal that you are trying to hear and you as the as the intended receiver of that message. Um, And so when someone is speaking to you and you're wearing hearing aids, the sound of their voice has to travel to the microphones that are on your hearing aids. Um, What we need to try to do is capture as much of that sound energy from the person that you're speaking with or who you're trying to hear. And we have the ability to really pick up that sound from a much shorter distance from their mouth. So as that sound is traveling from here to say a few inches or maybe even a foot away, that's much better than it having to travel six, seven, eight feet away to the, uh, you know, the person that you're speaking with. Um, And with that, we're also doing it through direct audio input. And so we're basically wirelessly streaming the sound signal, whatever it may be, TV, voice, something like that. We're wirelessly streaming that into both of the hearing aids, which then that is corrected for your hearing loss and amplified appropriately from there. Absolutely. Now, to give an example of what you might experience in your daily life already is that if you have hearing aids and those hearing aids can stream audio from your smartphone, like phone calls or Mm -hmm. a YouTube video or a YouTube live like this one right now into your ears, that is called direct audio input. And you're usually like, oh my gosh, I hear everything so clearly. If everyone could just talk this way, that would do great. Well, the reason you're hearing it so great is because it's direct audio input. On top of that, if you do not have hearing aids yet, and you go and you have a set of uh, headphones connected to your TV, and you put those on your ears, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can hear the TV so much more clearly when it's coming through the headphones. That is direct audio input. So when you're using a lot of these assistive listening devices, one of the biggest benefits is that you get that direct audio input. You don't have any noise mixing in with that signal. You don't have reverberation of your living room or whatnot mixing in with that signal and it dramatically improves your signal to noise ratio. Yep. And so when you start using devices like this, what is uh, how much benefit? We've talked about signal to noise ratio loss already. We talked about low scores, we talked about high scores. How much does this improve the score? Yeah, so if we have an individual like the one that we saw previously with an 18 dB SNR loss, um, many assistive listening devices have the ability to improve the signal to noise ratio by nine decibels or more. It's really dependent on the setup, but nine decibels is huge because earlier as we were speaking and saying that the 10 decibels is the doubling of volume and then we were doubling the doubling of the volume, it takes you back down uh, a notch for that individual. But let's say someone has a score of 12 and then we're able to remove nine decibels or or decrease the SNR loss by nine decibels, now they're at a three. You're in the normal range at that point, you know? So Yeah, and you get the direct audio input. There's also, you had, you had alluded to the idea of depending on how you set it up. Mm-hmm. So we can set it up to where we take the audio that's being streamed to the individual hearing aid wearer, and we can mute their microphones on their hearing aids yes. so their hearing aids aren't picking up all of the noise mixing in inside of their ears. So we can give a much cleaner signal that way too. Definitely. Um, and then the other side of that is, is that uh, depending on the type of device, 
device that you use, you, the distance between the person that you're talking to with the microphone uh, matters. It so does. if you have a, a microphone that's clipping on very close to their mouth on their shirt, you're going to get a better signal to noise ratio on that. And if you have it a little bit further away from them, it's not going to improve it quite as much. Yep. So those are all considerations we need to make sure we're paying attention to. Definitely. Distance is still very much playing a role here. Um, so I do want to say something here because we talked about some pretty technical things just now. If yeah. you guys have questions on this, make sure that you ask your questions in the comments section because uh, the things that we do, it seems normal to us when we're talking about signal to noise ratio and signal to noise ratio loss and all of that stuff, but to everyone else it might not make a whole lot of sense. Oh, yeah. And if you are looking for a provider in your area who speaks the same language that we're talking right now, finding a hearing up provider in your area is going to be the type of provider that is going to be able to go through these things with you in detail and make sure that you're optimizing your signal to noise ratio with your hearing aids. Now, the hearing up provider network is a network that I started. All of these individuals are committed to following best practices. When we talk about doing tests like the, the Quicksyn test, that is considered best practice to test your speech and noise capabilities. And so if you do not go to a provider who does these things, you're not going to have a clue how well you're going to be doing in background noise and if you need additional help like using an assistive listening device. Right, most definitely. So we've got some different kind of categories of assistive listening devices to kind of lay down some of this framework here. And so many assistive listening devices can be used without hearing aids, actually. And like you were talking earlier, TV, ear sets, um, anything that, that uses direct audio input. Um, a lot of individuals are exploring the idea of using AirPods as a, as a bit of a hearing enhancement technology. Um, but that's really not what we're gonna be focusing on today. Today, we're really gonna be focusing in on the devices that can be used with hearing aids um, and, and are used primarily when hearing aids alone are not able to provide an adequate amount of support in these more difficult listening situations. And our main goal with any assistive listening device is just to increase speech comprehension, quite honestly, and get a, a cleaner, stronger signal so that you're able to have access to whatever you're trying to listen to that's important to you. Yeah, and when you're talking about cost benefit analysis here, uh, this is where my brain goes, is like, okay, how much money do I have to spend to get a significant increase in my ability to hear and understand speech? And by far, the best spend of money that you could possibly do when it comes to your hearing is to use an assistive listening device along with your hearing aids. I mean, to think that you might be spending thousands of dollars on a pair of hearing aids with all the care that comes along with it to make sure that they work properly, you could spend a few extra hundred bucks to use an assistive listening device to dramatically improve your ability to hear and background noise with those hearing aids that cost you thousands of dollars that you're trying to use uh, to do the same. Definitely. I, I think that it's one of one of the easiest ways to add such an incredible amount of value to your hearing aids, whether or not you have difficulty in, in certain situations, and we'll get into what situations are, are best for these devices. Um, but really, these devices can be utilized by anybody. Um, so we see these devices used very, very frequently in school systems for school-aged children, uh, especially with individuals who have cochlear implants, things like that. Um, but any age and any hearing loss configuration as well. And we haven't had the ability to jump into auditory processing disorder on this podcast just yet, but there are many individuals who have very little amount of hearing loss, if any at all, who can still benefit from the use of assistive listening devices. Um, but it's also very, very individual. So it's based on more than just your hearing loss and the situation where it's needed. It's going to be dependent on so many factors of whether you have success with them or not. But I'd say a majority of our individuals that move forward with assistive listening devices love them. It's very rare that you have someone, and, and a lot of places will demo them for you yeah. and like let you take them home, take them for a test run uh, to see, okay, are you going to use it, A, yep. and B, how much benefit do you get from it? And every single time that we do that, I feel like it's it's hands down like, oh yeah, this is a huge difference maker right. uh, for a lot of individuals. Now, it, this is device dependent too, so if we're talking specifically with hearing aids, you have to make sure that you go with an assistive listening device that's actually compatible with your hearing aids. And I've actually had patients that we've recommended certain brands of hearing aids because we knew that the assistive device was so critical for them. Yeah. And, and I would rather have them have the best assistive device rather than maybe a hearing aid that would check a few more boxes for them on other things that aren't quite as important for them. Most definitely. I changed my you know, initial 
plan uh, for treatment for patients all of the time after we do the quick sin and I realize, okay, um, these background noise environments are going to continue to pose challenges to this individual, um, even with well-fit hearing aids at this point, at this point an assistive listening device is is going to be such a significant improvement over what they're experiencing with their own hearing aids and I will change brands or manufacturers or whatever needs to be done to make sure that they have access to those devices in that moment or even in the future if they're not ready to, to go there just yet. And this is the great thing about person-centered care is that we have these discussions with the individual. I, I don't like the idea of like, oh, well, we just tested your hearing. We'll see how you end up doing in background noise once you treat your hearing loss, and then we can go in a certain direction if we have to. Yeah. But I think it's important that individuals actually understand what is going on with your hearing and how much difficulty you would expect to have in a background noise situation. And I think it's misleading not to know what your signal to noise ratio loss score is going into this. Um, and then the, the devices. So I wouldn't want to recommend devices if I didn't know if a patient was open to using an assistive listening mm -hmm. device. For instance, if someone's like, well, I want a completely in canal hearing aid and they have a horrible speech and noise score, well, a completely in canal hearing aid is not going to be compatible no. with some of these assistive devices that they might need to hear better in background noise. And if their number one priority is hearing better in background noise, I cannot um, ethically recommend yeah. Uh, completely in canal hearing it that doesn't have compatibility. And again, this is so important. This Quixin testing, or there's several different speech and noise tests that are out there. So just because you don't see Quixin on your audiogram doesn't mean that one wasn't done. But I will say they are not done very often out in the real world of audiology. Um, and right there, you just said, if this individual is, is more inclined towards a more discreet in the ear type of a hearing aid and you don't run this test and you don't have a good understanding or a fair understanding of of what their abilities are to separate speech from background noise then six months down the line they continue having the same issues that they came into you originally with and you don't have the ability to attach an assistive listening device to them at that point or or to offer them in that moment and you're kind of you're you're kind of stuck your, your hands are kind of tied in that moment so it's so important doing a lot of this digging in the front end, even at the hearing test appointment and having that information ready to go because it is going to determine so many factors for you down the line. Absolutely. And now there is a silver lining to this is that the vast majority of hearing aids that have are dispensed today do have this direct compatibility. Yes. Yes. So a lot of receiver and canal devices, a lot of behind the ear devices, a lot of like full shell and maybe even half shell in the ear devices have a lot of wireless compatibility with these types of assistive listening devices. So um, if you are someone who's like, man, I really wish I could use something like we're about to talk about here mm -hmm. uh, later on the, in the show, uh, you probably have the ability to tap into these after the fact, even though they weren't part of the major consideration of uh, your initial appointment that you had with your provider. Most definitely. All right. So before we get into those, let's jump into our next sponsor. This is, this is my favorite, I actually. Know. So um, this is Scrappy. We're going to put Scrappy up on the screen here. Now, Scrappy is our audiology assistant's dog, so Alexis's dog. And Scrappy looks cute, but Scrappy is a killer. Scrappy <laughs> is a killer of hearing aids. If you put a hearing aid around this dog, I guarantee you that this vicious little animal right here would totally destroy that particular hearing aid. Now, I have a hearing aid here, actually, that was destroyed by, not by Scrappy. Scrappy is a lovable animal, um, but this was killed by a different dog um, and this brother. is scrappy's brother probably yeah. but dogs love to chew hearing aids and if your dog chews your hearing aids it's not that big of a deal because most people have loss and damage insurance on their devices you get a replacement device from the hearing aid manufacturer but if you use that one time you cannot use it again and that's where esco comes into play so esco specializes in providing loss and damage and repair insurance coverage for your hearing aids so you do not have to pay for expensive repairs or buy new hearing aids before you're ready they have a variety of different coverage plans, uh, so you can get a quote for your exact hearing aids on their website. And so if Scrappy happens to rip apart your hearing aids, you can reinstate your loss and damage insurance on those devices. Uh, if you go to esco.com forward slash Dr. Cliff, Dr. Cliff Show viewers will get a $10 Visa gift card just for registering your hearing aids. Thank you, Esco. Okay, so let's jump into the very first uh, class, if you will, of assistive listening devices that we're going to be reviewing today. Um, this is one that I recommend very, very frequently for individuals who are primarily struggling with 
one speaker for the most part. Um, and so we're going to be talking about remote microphones, uh, sometimes referred to as partner microphones as well. And so I've got a remote microphone here and it looks just like this guy. Um, and remote microphones, how they work is that there are some microphones on this device and these microphones are capturing the input from the device and then that sound signal is being wirelessly transmitted to each of the hearing aids. And generally, this device is going to be clipped on to your shirt right about there. And think about that. If you're at dinner with someone, right, and they have a fancy long table like the one that we're sitting at now, you're on one end, I'm on the other end. Generally, the sound of my voice would have to travel all the way across the table and hit your hearing aid mics on your actual devices. By the time that, that the sound has traveled that distance, it's getting muddled up with background noise. It's losing sound energy over, over that distance. Um, but when I'm using a device like this, my voice has to travel, what, mere inches? Inches. Like two, three inches at max. All of that sound energy that I'm projecting is being preserved because it's being picked up at this spot and then being sent over to your hearing aids. They're so incredible. I think they are the coolest things ever. It's literally like you're standing three inches away from my ear and talking if yeah. you're in a noisy environment. And I mean, that's what people do when it gets incredibly noisy. What do you do? You go and lean into yep. the person's ear and you talk into their ear. That is the equivalent of that. But not only that, it gets transmitted to both of your hearing aids if you happen to wear two hearing aids. And we can program the settings of that very specifically to an individual's hearing loss prescription. Yeah. On top of that, we can configure noise reduction settings inside of that. So if we want to uh, push down on some of the other noise that might even be working its way into the microphone, we can mute the microphones like I talked about earlier on the hearing aid so that background noise doesn't mix in with the signal along the way. There's just so many things that we can do with this technology now that even when I started getting into audiology, you had no ability to customize this stuff whatsoever. It was like you just turn it on and hopefully you cross your fingers yeah. and it would work. It would help, but we can do so much more with it now that we can just make it that much better. Well, they're just getting to the point as well where they're able to take the same technology that they've put into the hearing aids regarding like directional microphones and start applying a lot of that technology to these types of devices as well. And so it just, you start getting this almost like ecosystem of products that are all working together um, to give you the best possible chance at speech understanding in difficult situations. And so one of the first situations that I wanna touch on that, that a device like this could be really, really helpful in um, is going to be in like a classroom setting. And so many children who have hearing loss um, or auditory processing disorder, their uh, teachers will wear this device so that the sound of their voice is being picked up and sent right into the hearing aids because classrooms are noisy. I don't know if you've ever been in a first or second grade classroom recently, but like, thank goodness. No, no, <laughs> it is. It is wild in there. Okay. And so kids who have hearing loss, they're already in these really um, pivotal language learning periods and they need to have full access to sound. They need to be able to hear what their teacher is saying. And this device is going to make sure that they have the best possible shot at that. And not just elementary school classrooms, but college level as well, because many college courses are in large rooms, even auditoriums at times, reverberant floors and, and walls and uh, everything's, you know, super sterile and plastic and glass. Overall, just a, a terrible listening situation or you're in an auditorium that seats 500 and you get stuck in the back row and the distance from the speaker is incredible. So at that point, we're able to really clean up the signal for both distance and background noise. Yeah, and one of the worst recommendations that, that people have been making, even professionals have been making, is like, oh, you have trouble hearing? Well, just move to the front of the classroom. It's like, it. we need to get past that. We like do. That is by far the worst advice that I've ever heard because we know better. Yep. We know better that we should not be giving that advice anymore. We need to be giving direct audio input to these individuals in these classrooms um, to make sure that they have access to all of the information that is being shared inside of that classroom. And, classroom and using assistive listening devices, using FM systems is what we typically think about. Those are the ways that we can tie children or students in with their teachers. So anytime that their teacher talks, even when they're facing away, writing something on the smart board or whatnot, um, that they get the sound of what that teacher is saying back into their ears. Most definitely. Now there's other instances that this can be extremely helpful as well. For example, many 
Many businesses recently, uh, you know, with COVID uh, regulations, had put up plexiglass barriers. And um, individuals who work in environments where they are working behind the plexiglass can also have an extreme amount of difficulty hearing the customer or whoever is in front of them through the plexiglass. Well, this type of device could just be situated on the outside of the plexiglass, and now you're not losing any of that sound energy reflecting off of the plastic barrier that's there. Um, another situation I can think of is, um, you know, a lot of people are Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, taxi cab drivers. Um, you cannot be turning your head 180 degrees backwards to the back seat to get a visual every time someone is speaking. But with a remote microphone system, if they were to rig this up and, and put it behind the headrest in the back seat, okay, now we've just cut that distance and now it's picking up that sound and sending it straight into the hearing aids. No need to turn your head around. Absolutely, and you and you have all the other personal situations that you could be in. If you're trying to hear your spouse at dinner, like we t alluded to a little bit before, if you're trying to hear your grandchildren, but they're too far away from you, they're on the other side of the living room and yep. you can't hear what they're saying, you can clip a remote microphone on them, or sometimes you can even set it down closer to them, which brings us into, we have a variety of other types of remote listening devices as well, and media devices are actually really big on this as well. Uh, but let's first, let's get into the table microphone. So how is a table microphone different from what you're wearing right there, which is a little one inch by two inch microphone on your collar? So remote microphones generally are for one speaker and intended to end up in one set of hearing aids. So it's more of a one-to-one -one connection. Table mics, like the one that I have here, table microphones are actually intended to um, pick up sound or speech from several speakers with the potential to take that information and send it into hearing aids of several users potentially just one user, but if there are multiple users that have the same make and model type of devices that are compatible with this, it could be uh, several speakers to several hearing aid wearers at that point. Yeah, and, and it works in a very similar fashion. You're cutting down the distance between the person that you want to hear and your ears. And so it might not work quite as well as one that you clip directly on, like, two inches away from somebody's mouth. But if you're can, if you trying to hear multiple people, you don't wanna just hear one person mm -mm. with the remote microphone yeah. clipped onto them. You wanna hear a variety of different people. And even if it, it doesn't give you as clean of a signal from everybody, at least you can hear everybody better in that scenario. Yeah, and so again, if we go back to this idea of classrooms, group projects, right? Several kids at, in one area, they might be at a larger table where they have to work on things together. This allows that individual the highest amount of access to all of the speech from all of the people at that table. Um, at, in a work situation, conferences, meetings, I know that so many individuals that come in to us that are still working uh, will say often, I have these large you know, board meetings at work and we're at this table that's 30 feet long and I'm supposed to be able to hear the presenter down at the other end of the table that's, that's pointing to this PowerPoint. I can't hear them, I'm too far away. This again allows you to cut that distance and then when people at the end of that table start to have a discussion, you're able to pick up from multiple speakers in that environment. Yeah, and we can leave the microphones on the hearing aids available so if someone starts talking closer to you, yeah. you're still using your hearing aid microphones. Yeah. But what happens when you're in a cocktail party environment and you can't necessarily set a microphone down on a table? You have to have another way to intermingle with other people who are coming up to you. Definitely, definitely. So there are, there are personal situations as well where like restaurant settings, um, several several people cocktail settings like you just said um, church groups bible study where it's not just a one-to-one -one, it's several people several individuals again um, and what's nice is that these devices can also though be body worn too so a lot of these double as remote microphone systems that are worn on your body um, they can kind of serve dual purpose in, in that respect where you can even wear it on yourself if you would just like to have a little bit better speech understanding at that point, 
or it can be set on the table and, and several individuals can be engaged at the same time. But we also have devices that you can literally point at somebody oh, to, like if someone comes up to you and you're having a conversation with someone and oh, all of a sudden they start talking to you and you're like, oh my gosh, I better like actually look over at you and start talking to you. You have a pen that you could literally, you can be weird about it. You can be like interview style, you know, yeah. and, and have them talk directly into the pen or you can kind of hold it back nonchalantly like this and point it at their mouth and have that conversation with them. And this is a very directional microphone that's picking up what they're saying and sending it directly into your ears and it's improving that signal to noise ratio as well and these can be multi-use so they come with a little base stand here and so when we start talking about like being able to hear media better like on the tv you can use these for multi-purpose and even the one that you just had in mm -hmm. your hands that has a base stand that you can plug into the tv and now you get direct audio input from the tv right into your hearing aids and let me tell you if you have not experienced hearing tv through direct audio input with your hearing aids you are missing out because sure. that is the number one best-selling accessory that anyone would ever have with hearing aids is a TV streaming device. And we have one of those to show as an example here as well if you want a dedicated TV streamer. We've got a couple of them. And so different manufacturers have different makes and models for these devices. So depending on which one is compatible with your hearing aids, you may end up with one that looks like this. You may end up with one that looks like this. Regardless, they're both doing the same exact thing. These are hardwired into your TV device. They can also be rigged up to be plugged into laptops, cell phones, um, radios, pretty much anything that has like an audio jack on it. A lot of these devices can work with them as well and send any media that you're using or receiving through that device straight into your hearing aids. The other nice thing is that I think a lot of people assume that like, oh, well, if I take the audio and I send it into my hearing aids and anyone else that I'm watching the TV with is not going to be able to hear the TV. Well, that is true if you set it up incorrectly. Yeah. So there are some accessories that you plug into the headphone jack on the back of your TV and it does cut off the audio for everyone else. You get a nice dedicated stream so you're happy, but your spouse and your friends and family, like they're not happy. Yeah. So there are ways of setting these up to where you can get the direct audio stream for yourself and then everybody else listens to the TV at the exact same level that they listen to the TV at and then everybody's happy yeah. at that point. Yep, totally. I People always say that. They're like, it's going to cut the sound for everybody else. No, it's not. It's going to keep the sound the same for everybody. Um, and these same types of adapters are also available for landline phones as well. So many individuals with Bluetooth hearing aids have their hearing aids hooked up to their cell phones, um, but then they say, oh, I wish I had the same capability for my landline. Um, many manufacturers also offer phone adapters at that point, not only for personal use at home, but if you work and a lot of your job is on a phone and that phone is not allowed to be your cell phone, it's got to be you know the, the phone number that rings for the business, now you can have a phone adapter for for your work phone. Yeah, and I think this is a really good time to bring up the the JAN network. Yeah. So the job accommodation network is what it is. And uh, we actually have an overlay here for you, I believe. Uh, if you guys want some assistance at work, uh, if you work for an employer that has more than 15 employees, they are required by law to provide you with assistive listening devices if they would help you in your work environment. So if you want more information on how to actually get these job accommodations, make sure that you go to askjan.org mm -hmm. and they will be able to kind of walk you through a bunch of different training and a bunch of resources there. I've done videos on my channel about reasonable accommodations. Um, you should not have to pay for your own devices to be able to function in a work environment. Hearing aids is a different story. You do have to pay for your own hearing aids because you would use them outside of work. But if you need additional help at work with things like setting up the telephone so you can hear on the phone, using remote microphones in a conference room scenario, things like that, you should not be having to foot the bill for that. The, your employer, as long as you work for an, uh, a company that has 15 or more employees, by the Americans with Disabilities Act requirements, they have to provide you with reasonable accommodations. That they do. So before we start jumping into the uh, Q&A section here, um, I, we're going to move into our last sponsor slot here. And I'm excited for this one because oh. we've talked about EOSERA from the very beginning. Uh, and they've got an entire lineup of comprehensive ear care products, including the wax softening drops that we use in the office when we have that really tricky stubborn earwax that just will not come out. Now I'm going to give everybody a warning if you don't like seeing icky disgusting things uh, 
then this is your moment to look away. However, if you keep looking at the screen, you're going to see just how well EOSERA stacks up to um, in a competition versus the leading competitor for earwax softening drops. And so over on the right hand side, we've got earwax MD. This again is what we use in the office. Um, we love it. And you can see right there, the, uh, the one on the other side, that's one of the, the other companies, it does not even dissolve at all. I don't even see any real, real change there. And that's after nine or 10 minutes. But the one on the right hand side, I mean, there is no denying that that has been uh, broken apart nicely. And when we move in at that point with irrigation or suction, all of that stuff is going to be removed really, really easily. So Absolutely. EOSERA's great. Uh, make sure you visit EOSERA.com and use promo code CLIFF. 20 for 20 percent off your entire purchase they've got so many other products but if you've got issues with stubborn hard earwax this is the one for you absolutely thank you eo sarah all right so q a time we've got hello. kelsey back hello uh thank you guys again for all of the uh participation online it's always uh so fun that i get to uh you know have conversations with you guys in the comments uh, so today we do have a few questions uh, regarding some of the assistive listening devices that you guys have talked about. The first question is, what's your favorite one? Oh, favorite? I mean, so not to go first, not to you know, <laughs> go jump right in here. Honestly, my favorite is probably the TV streamer. So mm -hmm. the, the TV connector from Phonak is I think it's just su super user friendly. You turn the TV on, it just starts working automatically. If an individual does not like that function, you can always switch it and do something else where you have to activate it. You can go into your smartphone app and turn it on, turn it off. Uh, you can adjust the balance of what you're getting from your hearing aids versus what you're getting from the direct stream. And even though it's not like multifunctional, it's only really for the TV, um, I just think that it's, it's super easy and it's the one that people are most willing to utilize. And if they're willing to use it, that makes me love it. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, that's a great point. So a lot of these devices, individuals don't want to fiddle around with them. They, they just d simply don't want to use them. That's totally fine. But if you're willing and open to seeing how much benefit you could really receive from something that's very little difficulty in using other than charging and remembering to use, um, I love really any sort of clip-on remote microphone that I have on like right now, um, primarily because so often I will have couples that come into the office and they'll say, well, I could just hear my spouse if they would not talk to me from four rooms away and with their head in the cabinet or dishwasher and they're mm -hmm. turning around, their voice is trailing off. We can solve literally all of those complaints by just clipping the mic onto the spouse. Um, I, I think it's great because I, I don't know about you guys, but when I have someone who has this laundry list of situations in, in their own household that this continues to be an issue in, not necessarily background noise either, just distance and setup and acoustics, all those things. This is such a game changer for those individuals. It really is. I, I absolutely agree. I also really like uh, some of the devices that are multifunctional. Yeah. So like a device like the Roger on IN, for example, yeah. it has the pointing aspect that you guys are talking about. You can still clip it on to somebody. You can also use it as a table microphone as yeah. well. And so I just think that's uh, things like that that have dual purpose uh, end up being really effective for people, again, who are willing and wanting to use them. To use them. Um, and totally. that's always the biggest, you know, challenge is uh, what are you willing to do? I can give you all of the answers, but I can't make you wear it either. Yeah, and the people so. who do choose to use them love them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's just, it's unbelievable that, that they would ever fathom going without using an accessory like that ever again once they start using it. Yeah. yeah. I think we give out loaners a lot of the times and people are like, oh yeah, okay, three days later, I definitely mm -hmm. want one, make sure it's there for me when I come back. It's so. so rare that someone comes back from a trial with one of those devices and they're like, meh. Hey. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. doesn't really happen. They're that normally only like, happens if oh they don't even attempt to use it. And that does, yeah. we do run into that. Again, you got to be willing and able to use the device. You got to be willing to take, you know, a few minutes to get it set up. You might have to do a little bit of troubleshooting, but once you get through that learning curve, and the, the great sailing. thing is, is a lot of manufacturers are making it plug and play to the point yeah. where like your audiologist sets it up. Like they do the complex side of it and you just turn it on. Mm -hmm. So the yep. microphone you were talking about, the Roger on IN, you literally, to turn it into a table microphone, you set it on the table. Set it down. That's if you it. want it to be a pointing microphone, you point it you at someone. It. <laughs> if you mm -hmm. want it to be a lapel microphone, you clip it onto someone's shirt and that is all that you have to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, seamless. They're, they're getting so much better than they even were three and four years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, so are there manufacturers who have better devices than others uh, to pair with your hearing aids? 
I wouldn't say better necessarily. I just do think that some manufacturers have wider varieties of rem like assistive listening devices than others. So certain companies have maybe one remote mic and one TV connector, but we were just talking about phone adapters, table microphones. Those aren't offerings for every single company. That's true. And it depends on how you define better. Like uh, a lot of the remote microphones, if you start looking at the top six manufacturers of hearing aids, they all have some version of a remote microphone. They're all going to get you roughly a nine decibel improvement in signal to noise ratio. So. Um, if you're looking at better from that perspective, no. I mean, you look at an assistive listening device, a TV a connector that's going to send audio directly into your ears, you're going to get hear the same quality level if you use one of those major brand devices. Um, it really comes down to utility. Is there is there yeah. one device for you that would actually make more sense for you based on what it can actually do? Um, and a lot of them have a lot of good ones. I mean, I start thinking about like, well, man, Phonak has a lot of really good ones, but they also don't have certain ones that like Oticon would have yeah. that we would need to treat someone. So it really just depends. Well, and I think that that brings us back to something we talked about in our last episode as well about the communication needs assessment and really making mm -hmm. sure that we understand as your provider what exactly you're looking for, what problems yeah. are you trying to solve. Um, because then if there is a particular manufacturer that has a particular you know accessory that would be the thing to solve your problem, if we don't know that when we're picking hearing aids, then we might not pick the brand uh, that had the device you needed. Whereas, you know, when we do go through a very detailed assessment with you, um, we can definitely pick out those things early on. And that way we just pick the hearing aids that we know can pair with the thing you need to solve that problem. And yeah. just to be clear, like that is best practice. Best practice yeah. is at the onset, you're considering accessories that would potentially need to be used by an individual later on down the road. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Yep, thinking about the patient in the current moment, but also thinking about what their future, anticipating their future needs as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, I got one more question for us. Uh, if the table microphone is just sitting on the table, won't it also pick up the sounds of the plates and the silverware and the banging on the tables as well? It can. It can. I mean, there, there's pros and cons to everything. Yeah. Like, I mean, Again, it, the further you take a microphone away from the person's mouth, the worse it will perform. Mm -hmm. The closer you put it to a noise source. You could technically take a table microphone, put it in the kitchen where all the kitchen noise is at, and it'll be like, this is horrible yeah. mm -hmm. because all you're getting is the kitchen noise. So yes, there is some aspect of you might be hearing some more table noise in general. Uh, there are different features though. There's impulse noise reduction mm -hmm. that you can enable in these accessories. So if you do get someone slamming a plate down, you can catch that in the programming of the way that we have it set up with the devices and we can reduce that down. Some people will actually take a table microphone and turn an upside down glass and set it mm -hmm. on top of that to get it away from all of the noise that's hitting the table itself and kind of buffer it a little bit. So there's ways that you can get around it. Most definitely, like you said, um, I think when we're talking about microphones, it's easy to think that it's a microphone that's just picking up anything and everything all of the time. What's really, really different about these systems is that they do have the directional microphones in them as well and have this ability to kind of separate out some of that background noise. Um, and like with this system specifically, you can see we've got these green lights kind of all in a circle there. I uh, can't, probably can't see it with the lights in here, but we can literally tap and pick the directions of the individuals on the table that you want to hear better. And so this one has six different kind of beams that come out of it. And so if it's only the three of us sitting here, I can literally angle one of the beams straight towards you, one of the beams straight towards you, and I'm not picking up any of the microphone input from anything in front of me that I'm not trying to hear at that point. So it's much more sophisticated than just a standard microphone. Yeah, and it has a lot of automatic um, you know, decision-making qualities that it's doing as well. Yeah. So for example, if you know we are at a table and it is just the three of us, even if we don't necessarily select, but Dr. Olson and I start you know, talking at the same time, it's going to pick up those two beams because we're both two very prominent speakers yeah. and therefore you're still going to get that input from both of us and it will uh, start to negate the things that are coming from the front of you. So even if you don't necessarily tap them, it's making a lot of decisions for you based on what it knows about sound and communication yeah. that has been programmed into it. So yeah. very yeah. sophisticated devices. I think it really comes down to if this is a new concept for you, 
like you need to ask your hearing care professional For about sure. it. I mm-hmm. mean, hands down. Um, again, if, if you want a significant improvement in your ability to hear, particularly in background noise and at a distance from someone, the best money that you could ever spend in your entire life is one of these accessories For sure. to be able to accomplish that. Mm-hmm. For sure. Absolutely. I agree. If you're willing and able to put in the time and effort to learn how to use it and in which situations to use it, absolute game changer for you. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for those questions, guys. Thank you for the questions in general. Keep those questions coming. Each week we are back here. Uh, Obviously, you did notice that we were not here last week for Thanksgiving. We have a couple of other days off the rest of this year for the holidays, but we will be here next week on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and WTSMTV.com. If you have not yet hit that like and subscribe button, go ahead and do that as well. And as always, we'll see you next week.